Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis, and these are the three big stories for today. And when I say three big stories, I mean like there's something in each of these articles that really shapes the way that you think about things. And that's what I'm trying to do with the three big stories segment. Okay, so Ukraine tells Trump to emulate Reagan as Putin readies a major spring offensive. And so here, uh, U.S. Republicans and their candidate for the White House, Donald Trump, must remember that they're the party of Ronald Reagan and support Ukraine as Russian forces build up for a major offensive from May or June. That was the message from Andrei Yermak, Ukraine's president, uh, Ukraine President Zelensky's powerful chief of staff. That's right. Remember what Reagan would have done. What would he have done? I, like if Russia was going over the border here and the United States had the ability to do something, what, what would he have done? How many missiles do you need? Not, you know what, we really want to use this as leverage in order to get other domestic priorities. Uh, that, that's not what would have happened. Reagan famously called uh, Russia the evil empire. Okay, I don't believe anybody who represents the party of Ronald Reagan will abandon Ukraine. Now, there's a schism within the party. So I know that some are like, ah, oh, it's all MAGA. It's all. It's not all MAGA. Not everybody has given up. And some people are like, well, you just got to vote blue. You just got to go over to the Democrats. The Dem Democrats don't want me. They might want me to vote for, for Biden, but they don't want me. I have to get my party back. Reagan understood the social Soviet Union and Russia, and anyone who does will continue to support our fighters because they understand that dictators never stop voluntarily and have to be stopped, he said. I think there's a, a divide between Reagan Republicans and MAGA Republicans, and there are even some MAGA Republicans who support Ukraine, but they're fewer and further between. But there's a divide that way, but there's also kind of a generational divide. I see people that are 50 and older that's, that remember the old Soviet Union that tend to be more Reagan Republican-like. And I see also a experience divide. People who have been over to Eastern Europe, like I've been in parts of the former Soviet Union in Lithuania and, and even in Belarus, and I've seen what has happened there. And I, yeah, I, I <laughs> this can't stand. Okay. Um Biden aides have been working behind the scenes to ensure House Speaker Mike Johnson does put the multi-billion dollar aid package for Ukraine up for a vote as early as next week. Now, I don't know what it'll be next week, but as soon as possible. I talked about this yesterday as well. Biden has publicly pressured House Republicans to pass the package, but avoided attacking the Speaker, opting to give him the space to persuade his fractious GOP caucus. So there really is a schism within the party. Johnson knows that as soon as he puts this thing forward, someone like Marjorie Taylor Green will come at him uh, and maybe try to get him out of the speakership. So it's a very dangerous place for Speaker Johnson to be, and there's such a slim uh, majority that, yeah, bad things can happen, and he knows it. So it's a very difficult thing. Biden's giving him room to try to operate. We know that Putin is preparing a new wave of mobilization, and we reckon that the new counteroffensive operations by the Russians could start at the end of May or the beginning of June. We're not even talking about a Ukrainian counteroffensive this year. We're talking about the Russians coming at Ukraine further this year, starting in May or June. And they don't have the weapons to be able to fight back. Of course, we have to be ready for this, Yermak said. We still critically need additional air defense systems because without them, it's impossible for us to defend our cities, he added. So there's two levels. There's artillery, and they're working on that. And they really do need Patriot battery systems and other anti-aircraft or yeah, missile defense kind of systems. The 1.5 ton bombs are a conversion of an old Soviet, and like this is the thing that's really kicking their butts. It's the aerial glide bombs. 1.5 uh, ton bombs are a conversion of an old Soviet era weapon where you had to be kind of over the target or very close to over the target to this thing where the bomb drops and then there's some guidance system and it can go for many miles. And that has converted it into almost like a missile. Uh, and are delivered by fighter jets some 70 kilometers from the target and then directed by a guidance system using pop-out wings to glide toward its target. That's been game-changing for Russia. Now, if they had Patriot air defense, they could push them back where this wouldn't be as useful. It's a critical moment now. It's very important the package is approved this month, he said. Asked about whether Ukraine will heed America's pleas to avoid striking Russian oil facilities. Why? This is the way that they can fight back, and you fight with what you have. Yermak expanded on that, saying that there has to be, quote, payback for what the Russians are doing to us. We must ruin their critical infrastructure, as the only language they understand is force. Going back to the first uh, paragraph in the title, 
That's what Reagan understood about the Russians, that the only thing that they understand is force. And you have to deal with them that way. Not trying to be nice, not trying to make concessions, not trying to not escalate because they only understand force. Big story number two. There's a two-part here. Ukraine will become a NATO member, Blinken says, in Brussels. I want to show you just a couple paragraphs here, and then we'll move over to a second one about the same topic. Speaking at the biannual NATO summit, Blinken said that the purpose of the assembly is to, quote, help build a bridge to that membership and create a clear pathway for Ukraine moving forward, unquote. Now, Regarding NATO membership, Kaluba said Ukraine deserves to be a member of NATO. They really do. And this should happen sooner or rather sooner, uh, sooner, sooner that rather than later. Right. So it should happen. It needs to happen as quickly as it's feasibly possible for them to join NATO. And when they do join NATO, they're going to have the most experience dealing with threats to NATO. Okay, Blinken again. In terms of stocks of equipment, supplies, yeah, we one of the things that we talked about today was everyone going back and taking an immediate and hard look on what can be made available. Now, that's weird coming from him, being that we're tied up in the United States, but everyone needs to be doing that within NATO. We know what the needs are, air defenses, artillery, munitions. So I believe, based on what I heard today, that everyone, including the United States, is going to double back as necessary, double down on finding these resources. So they need to start doing that. Because while we're out, while we're working to address these immediate concerns, we're also working together to build out Ukraine's force for the future. This is important. They're thinking long term as well. A force that deters aggression and defends it against it if it has to. So one of the things that we get wrong is that we just think, well, why are we giving them all this stuff? Because we made guarantees back in 1994 and we need to keep our promise or we lose face and reputation before the world. And then bad things happen when you don't keep by your promises. It's true in life. It's true for nations. And we're, ourselves, the United States, working on our own bilateral agreement. That'll be interesting when that comes through. But we're also looking at the role of NATO, uh, that NATO can and should play over time in supporting Ukraine. And this is an ongoing discussion that we'll have in the weeks ahead, Blinken said. Okay, so that's with Blinken. Last article. This is really interesting because it's about Macron. And it shows how Macron has sh shifted over time. Okay. Speaking in Prague in early March, Emmanuel Macron warned Europeans that now was not the time to be cowardly. Like, he's got a spine all of a sudden that he didn't seem to have before. He seemed to be trying to be conciliatory and trying to be conciliatory, and then year went by, and now he's got some, like, wow, okay, who is this guy? Europeans, he said, will do everything that we must so that Russia does not win. Wow, so that's a pretty powerful statement. Not, you know, as long as we, it takes or as long as we have, you know, not lost interest or whatever. He's saying so that Russia does not win. In a live interview on national TV 10 days later, Macron doubled down, saying that the security of Europe and France was at stake in Ukraine and that if the situation should deteriorate, we would be ready to make sure Russia never wins this war. Double down on it. Okay. Europeans are feeling war fatigue. A recent survey by the European Council on Foreign Relations found that only 1 in 10 think that Ukraine will achieve a decisive military victory, while a plurality, 37%, believe the war will end in compromise settlement. Uh, now, that's interesting, the 1 in 10, a decisive military victory. I'm not sure that Ukraine will win a decisive European uh, a military victory, but I don't, I'm not saying that Ukraine won't win and prevail. I think the war will end because the battlefield for Russia, it'll be unsustainable and cause some kind of economic or political turmoil in Russia because it just has been grinding so so long and depleting such resources. I think that's the way it'll, it'll end. It might end in a compromise, but only if it's forced. Otherwise, the Ukrainians just have will to keep putting, putting pressure on it. But that's just my view. I could be completely wrong. This is just what I see with everything that I've read. Okay, two years ago, when Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, France was the odd country out, still trying to engage Moscow in the hope of restraining Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now France is one of the last bastions of unyielding support for Ukraine. There has been this really interesting inversion. And now the French president wants to Putin to know, I'm sorry, yeah, Putin to know that NATO's direct military involvement on the ground in Ukraine should not be ruled out. Now putting that on the table is... Something that's 
pushing back rather than saying, oh, we're not going to do that. We're not, we're, no, 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 we're not escalating. It's like if, if Russia didn't have nuclear weapons, and this is the misery, like Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons, then they were unarmed and they thought they had our guarantees. But if Russia didn't have nuclear weapons, they would have been just beaten to a pulp like a bunch of high school kids in a TikTok video, right? I mean, it's, would have, this would have been really bad for Russia because all the gloves would have come off. Okay, France's steadfast support for Ukraine may prove to be a game changer. French support for EU enlargement will accelerate the institutional and policy reforms needed to bring new members into the Union. Ahead of the European parliamentary elections, the European Council on Foreign Relations poll showed that a plurality of French voters remain supportive of Ukraine's fight to regain all its territory, a welcome contrast to the pessimism in countries like Greece, Hungary, and Italy where majorities wish to see their leaders, quote, push Ukraine toward negotiation with Moscow. Okay, so France is still kind of like, we'd like to see that happen. The French president's posture is also shaped by a sense of urgency over the rapidly deteriorating situation in Ukraine, which could prove to be an existential threat to Europe. Macron uh, understands that if the Kremlin is not deterred in Ukraine, others will fall victim to its imperialist designs. Look, they got 20% of Moldova, 20% of Ukraine, 20% of Georgia. What else could go wrong? Right? Like, they're seeing that this is this is a trend now. This isn't just a, an accident. Okay? Four days into Russia's invasion of his country, President Volodymyr Zelensky signed an official request for Ukraine to join the European Union. I remember thinking that was odd at the time. Like, uh, you have other fish to fry here. But at the time, it was viewed as symbolic. But uh, they're pushing pretty hard toward that. On the day, former pre French President Francois Hollande Hollandaid, I don't, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, I wasn't really paying attention to his time in office, spoke for many when he remarked that the urgency is not to get Ukraine into the European Union, but to get Russia out of Ukraine. Macron's attempt to play mediator between Moscow and Kyiv came to naught. Now, on May 2022, Macron proposed creating a European political com community, a 44 nation forum aimed at reinforcing the political coordination on the continent. The intergovernmental forum allowed Europeans to stand united in the face of Russian aggression, but the new organization was not meant as a replacement for full membership in the EU. So there would be like these levels of cooperation in Europe. In his first meeting in Prague in October 2022, saw a unanimous declaration for support for Ukraine, but resulted in no practical commitments. It didn't have to. It's kind of like the UN. It wasn't really doing much, but it was united in a large level, although it didn't do anything. French diplomats were finally convinced, this is the key, that France's efforts towards rapprochement, I, I might be butchering that, uh, rapprochement with, with Russia has been unproductive and that it was time to recalibrate. Macron clarified Paris's position the EU should enlarge as fast as possible. Now, this is a reversal of the way that France has traditionally thought about things. Remember, it was France and Germany that were like, when Ukraine was invited to the party with NATO, we were like, mm, no, maybe, yeah, not, not yet. Let's, let's slow down. Let's, we, we don't know that we want to do that. Back in 2008... Bigger would be better. The cost of integrating Ukraine, along with seven other applicant countries, into the European Union will be significant. The size of Ukraine alone is an issue. Its agricultural sector threatens the common agricultural policy that's underpinned European farming for the past 60 years. So it's just like in an organization where if you grow real fast and you don't have the infrastructure of the human resources and other admin accounting and all those other functions, it, it overloads, it taxes the system too much. And so they have to build that out. Okay, um, European U uh, institutions are ill-equipped to absorb the shock of a significant enlargement. Negotiating these changes at the EU level will take years as budgets and policies have to be adopted. France has promoted the idea of gradual integration, like you can get in at this level and then you move to the next level and to the next level, but you keep moving through the, through the ranks. 
The war in Ukraine exposed Europe's vulnerabilities and catalyzed decisions on rearmament and economic security. It also made clear the need for continental integration. Keeping Moldova, Ukraine, and the Western Balkans outside the bloc leaves them open to interference by foreign powers, which imperils the rest of Europe. Conversely, permitting their entry into the Union reinforces the security of all. So again, Macron shifted from a less to a bigger is better kind of scenario. For decades, France had believed that when it came to Europe, smaller was better, but the, when 10 post-communist countries entered the EU 20 years ago, France worried that their accession would constitute an impediment to the emergence of l'Europe Boussouans, or whatever, I don't know how you're pronouncing that, uh, literally a powerful Europe. Okay, so that has been a pretty massive shift, and that's part of why Macron is taking this tough stance. He took several months of brutal, or it took several months of brutal war for him to figure figure out that the Russian regime was not looking for an off ramp. Remember how in the first year of the war, so like, what will be an off ramp for Putin? How does he how does he get out of this? How does right? He's not looking for that. And several more to grasp that the Ukrainians, however determined, could not sustain an effective resistance without substantially more support from Europe. They really need it, and they're not getting it from the U.S., so Europe is getting the memo, mm, we got to step up if we want this to get fixed the right way. Macron's message of strength has been criticized as escalatory, but of course, we keep appeasing uh, Putin and, and self-deterring. Several European countries, such as Poland and Lithuania, have joined France in sending a strong message to Russia. In a meeting to, uh, in Berlin on March 15th, German Chancellor or the Polish Prime Minister and the French President sent a message of unity uh, to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. A few days earlier, the Polish Foreign Minister put it even more bluntly. Listen to this quote, and I think this is beautiful, a great way to end. I appreciate President Macron's initiative because it's about making Putin fear us not us fear Putin. That's the way it should be. The aggressor should not be the one that everyone's fearing. The aggressor should be, you know, in a position where he's like, you know, this wasn't a good idea. I need to get out. I got to back off. This isn't okay. All right. Last little thing I want to show you. I saw this on Twitter and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. The enduring usage of ex-Soviet is interesting given that we didn't see equivalent longevity or usage of ex-Hopsburg or ex-Ottoman. That's right. I, I mean, I don't I don't see that in the history books, ex-Hopsburg or ex-Ottoman, but you see lots of ex-Soviet. Their imprint, the Soviet imprint was just so profound and disturbing compared to what we see here. Okay, that's all that I have. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and the coffees, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.